furious farmers drive their protests home to the European Union. And more demonstrations are planned in their revolt against high costs, EU climate change policies, food imports and support for Ukraine. So, what political impact could their action have? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Spring is usually a time for farmers to get busy on the land. The season is still a few weeks away in Europe, but many farmers are already ploughing a different furrow, protesting in various countries. They say that EU policies, which national governments must enforce, could put many of them out of business. EU directives on climate change, granting Ukraine access to EU markets, rising fuel costs and deals allowing more imports of food from outside the EU are all being blamed. So is European farming really under threat or is this just grandstanding from a well-organised lobby group? What are the political implications for the EU if the protests continue? And what impact could they have on the EU's climate change plans? We'll be asking our guests these questions and more in a few moments after a report from Paul Ging on why farmers are on the streets. Farmers across Europe have been taking to the streets, leaving their farms for cities to bring their anger to the doorsteps of national governments and the EU. They're furious about EU policies adopted by their own governments. They also fear new environmentally friendly green policies to cut greenhouse gases as well as the knock-on effects of the Ukraine war and EU food imports threatening their livelihoods and their very existence in farming. Today we are here because we want to take care of the soil and the animals. Stop all these documents that are coming from the United, uh, the, the Europe because we don't want to lose our time to make more papers. Just we are farmers. We are uh, the people that uh, take care of the soil, take care of the animals, take care of your health, your food. The protests already seem to be bringing political concessions. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has scrapped plans to halve pesticide use, which would have cost farmers more but have benefited the environment. Farmers' support is important for her centre-right European People's Party in the European Parliament. Should farmers support other parties in elections this June, it could damage von der Leyen's hopes to win a second term. A green strategy was an important part of von der Leyen's platform when elected in 2019. But the reaction from farmers, heightened by higher inflation and energy prices, has complicated the maths for her presumed re-election strategy. Russia's war in Ukraine has also hit agriculture hard. Fuel prices have risen sharply and farmers fear a flood of cheaper grain and other produce from Ukraine after special access to EU markets was given to the Ukrainians following Russia's invasion. Added to that, governments have been trying to reduce supermarket prices as inflation continues to damage European economies. In Strasbourg, while the Climate Commissioner pushed his case for a 90% reduction in emissions, farmers outside the European Parliament were keen to explain that the burdens they're facing are already intolerable. We're here to meet the MEPs, to tell them that the current agricultural policy can no longer work because of the distortions of competition, and then products are being imported into Europe which have even less regard for our production conditions and constraints. And with a new EU-wide treaty with South American countries to import more Brazilian and Argentinian beef, farmers are further alarmed at the potential cost to them. Paul Ging, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. We're delighted to have two elected members of different parliaments with us to discuss uh, matters further today. From Dublin, we're joined by uh, Michael Fitzmaurice, an independent member of the Irish Parliament, who's a farmer himself and was elected as an advocate for farmers and rural communities. From Strasbourg, we're joined by Francisco Guerrero, who's an independent member of the European Parliament with the Group of Greens and European Free Alliance. And in Brussels, we have Peter Klepper, who's uh, a European 
policy analyst and editor-in-chief of the news website brusselsreport.eu, which covers the Eurozone. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Michael, let's start with you. Give us a sense of just how difficult it is to be a European farmer right now. They get a cut of a huge subsidy, roughly a third of the EU's budget. Are, are things really about that, that bad for them? Well, first of all, in relation to the subsidies, um, and welcome to all your guests, um, in relation to the subsidies, um, it's called CAP. Um, ironically enough, as when CAP was brought in, it was to make sure that people living in cities or people with a lesser income were able to afford uh, food, and rightly so. And everybody agreed with this. But the problem that has happened over the years is in the last CAP, the funding is less, so there's less money to go around. We are letting in, obviously, more countries. So the more countries that come in, when you have less of a budget, you know the answer yourself, there's less funding. But on top of that, the EU is constantly, and I see it in Ireland, I'll give you the case specific in the line of the brought in the Habitats Directive. They are now proposing to bring in the Nature Restoration Law, which I understand they are voting on in the next few weeks. You have the Water Framework Directive, you have the Science Directive, you have the LULUCF policy, and it's environmental legislation on top of environmental legislation coming. But the problem is, and there's any MEP that's on this program which you tell me, that uh, the new NRL, we call it the Nature Restoration Law, have made it very clear that there is no funding, because in my, in my understanding is that as part of support, and the DN said, that they didn't want as a country to be giving more money into the budget. So how can you keep pulling, pulling, pulling out of farmers, making them do more and more and more, while at the same time going to take, for instance, Ukraine? And it's not alone farmers. Have a look at lorry drivers. Lorries were let in and the price has been cut of hauling uh, with, with, for people living in Europe. The rates of pay in other countries outside Europe would be an awful lot less. We have a standard to keep in our areas. Okay. And on top of that, then, you have a Europe that is obsessed with doing deeds. If they talk about climate, you don't go bring in beef from Brazil or you don't go bring it from Argentina if you have it ready at hand in any of the countries in Europe. And farmers are suffering and they are sick of it. And okay. I believe in the coming elections this summer in June, uh, at the MEP elections, which will, uh, every country would be having, okay. that there'll be a clear message sent out because yeah. it's not alone okay. the farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, a lot Michael. Of people, Michael. And I've seen it, all right, M Michael. I've seen I mean, it in the countries right yeah. around about have made it very clear that they support okay, the farmers. Michael, in their you, you, you make a lot of points there that we will we will pick up on with with our, uh, our other guests. Francisco, let's start first of all with you and, and, and the the environmental. Uh, issues that uh, that Michael was was talking about there. Um, a climate activist with farmers or against them right now? I mean, they they, they joined them at protests this week. Uh, yes, so the, they have a common cause, and they should have also a common enemy. And it's not the greens; it's not the the green policies that we should be applying to also save agriculture. Let's be clear that who is running the European Parliament, the Commission, and also the member states for the last decades are not the greens. And so these policies that are being set, the free trade agreements, the income disparity that uh, farmers have, uh, and you see they are smashed by big corporations, by uh, the retailers, by the big pharma uh, and big agribusiness companies, these policies were not promoted by the Greens. Uh, we were alerting for this for almost four decades. Even from 1980, we are already stating the obvious that this common agriculture policy, policy the fisheries policy, these uh, free trade agreements will end up uh, smashing farmers. So uh, again, they have a, a really uh, important mission. Uh, they are subsidized to help uh, us have cheaper foods. But again, uh, we are warning them for more than 40 years. This is not the problem of green policies. The problem is that the European Union, with these three big groups, the Liberals, the Social Democrats and the Socialists, continue to smash uh, farmers. And in the end, 
uh, they don't promote a different type of production. In the beginning of the, to, uh, the, this mandate on uh, 2019, we had the opportunity to change the common agriculture policy, to have more funds, and to help farmers produce better with more help, for example, on eco schemes, that they would have more support to change their productions. These eco schemes are just a small percentage of the common agriculture policy, and we are talking about 360 billion euros. Um, and well, in the end, we voted against the common agriculture policy. We vote against the free trade agreements and the other groups supported the common agriculture policy and are now pushing for the free trade agreement with the Mercosur. So again, we do okay. sympathize. We, we are, the, I think, the best uh, allies of farmers, but don't put the blame on us. We are not uh, to, be, to, be, um, to be guilty of, of these policies of the last 40 years. Peter, what are we to make of uh, the European Commission's scrapping of its plan to halve pesticide use and the watering down of other uh, planned rules? Uh, politically, was, was this a genuine concession to struggling farmers or was it more designed to help Ursula von der Leyen win re-election in June? Well, these are very modest um, concessions. Um, the, uh, the pesticides regulation uh, already faced a lot of opposition in the European Parliament anyway, and von der Leyen has said that they still may come up with, uh, uh, with something. She also made a, a minor concession last week to postpone a land use restriction for about one year. Uh, so I think the problem is, uh, indeed, the, the Greens, the, the Green Party is not in charge, but the Green IDs are very much in charge. Uh, there are a number of green dogmas that, uh, especially the political mainstream, is uh, refusing to give up. Um, and, and that's why you see the same European Commission this week proposing the most uh, radical climate uh, targets ever to reduce CO2 levels uh, by 90 percent by 2040. Uh, and, and you wonder, how, how is this possible? Are they not reading the news? Uh, I mean, European industry is badly suffering as a result of high energy prices that are the result of uh, green experiments with our um, um, you know, energy production. Um, the, the Greens have always wanted to experiment indeed with the structure of farming. And, and I think farmers, they should abandon the idea that they should get state support. They should understand that if you give, if you receive money, that there will always be conditions linked to it that all kinds of, you know, policymakers and, and, uh, and all kinds of uh, action groups will try to, to use this, um, the subsidies as leverage uh, to try to crack down on, on your business model. I think par farmers are perfectly capable to survive in a free market. Uh, and I understand that they're angry about the competition from Latin America and from Ukraine, uh, because not always um, do these uh, importers into Europe have to comply with the same standards. So it's obviously not fair. Uh, but to then try to export uh, our standards to the rest of the world, I mean, that's just bizarre. I think our trading partners are saying, look, are you are you trying to trade with us or are you sending a list of um, regulations that you want us to uh, to implement? So, so genuine trade is, is about trusting, uh, trusting each other. So I think what we need is we don't need to, of course, Western abandon China. all of the standards, animal welfare okay. and stuff, but we need yeah. a rationalization. All right. Francisco, do you want to come in there? No, uh, for me this is bizarre. So, so trusting each other, so we don't have uh, to, to to have any regulations. For example, when you talk about pesticides, for example, we 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 ban certain pesticides that were proved to be uh, damage for health and for the environment here in the European Union, but we still export them. For example, uh, to South America. So we just wanted to trust uh, the, the other partners, and we just have no traceability on our products. So. On the one hand, you talk about uh, sovereignty, food security, and on the other hand, you are just saying for us to trust on each other. Well, this is remarkably for me to, to listen. And I, I also find it weird that you, you are also saying that just the free market should, should uh, maintain the agriculture system and they should not receive any support. We do feel that otherwise that they should have support also to change to more uh, sustainable practices. And this is a model that clearly understands the impact that we are having on the environment. And for example, in Portugal, in the south of, of, of Portugal, we are talking about water scarcity so, so, so dire that 70, so 70 percent uh, is, uh, is projected to cut on water for agriculture because we don't have water. 
and the 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 the, the data on climate is is uh, scary. Okay. Sorry, but all the scientific knowledge okay. is is available, and right. if we don't know nothing, the farmers will be the most uh, um, the most hit by by this climate change. Okay, uh, Michael, I'll get back to you in just a moment. But first, let, let's give Peter the right to reply then. Well, uh, if the European Union would indeed take a scientific approach, you could make a case. But look at the glyphosate debate. All the experts were saying it was fine. And still, uh, there was a massive push uh, to try to ban and uh, and restrict it. And indeed, with, when it comes to support for farmers, I mean, I understand the argument. The idea is, OK, some of them are struggling. Let's give them some cash. But let's look at the reality. 80% of, um, you know, these uh, these farming subsidies are, are going to the big boys, uh, the big concerns. And that's how it always goes. You know, when you have this uh, central planning system, you always end up with cronyism. And of course, it goes hand in hand with, uh, with protectionism, which at the end of the day, not only hurts uh, consumers, uh, but also uh, makes our farming uh, sector uh, less competitive. You know, if we are protectionist, then other trade blocks will always also be, um, you know, protectionist. And a lot of our farmers are actually exporting to the rest of the world. Uh, so I think it, it would be very unwise uh, to abandon, uh, you know, the idea that uh, trade is ultimately uh, good for uh, okay. for everybody. OK. All right. Michael, um, please feel free to come in on, on anything that you've heard in the last few minutes. But... I, I wanted to put it to you that, that farmers' um, main concerns vary from, from country to country. They do have grievances that are common to all. What, what is it that farmers want? Well, first of all, they want uh, to be treated fairly. Um, at the moment, the farmers, and I can speak for Ireland, but indeed right around Europe, um, this bashing that they get, you'd swear that they were the only people in the world that was putting basically putting up carbon or putting up methane. Um, you will hear people saying we need to get rid of all these animals. That's crazy stuff. As is being pointed out, um, if you can do something better, you always try and do it better. And a farmer on their land, uh, it costs them if they make mistakes. That's the bottom line. Um, in relation to Frances Fran Francesco, what he said, um, in relation, it's not the Greens. Well, I can tell you in Ireland, we have a Green Minister for Environment and we have a Green Minister that has gone over to Europe and has taken everything hook, line and sinker and agreed with it. Um, and, you know, you cannot keep bringing... Ireland is a different country and a different climate to Spain and to, you know, other parts of Europe. And when you do, when you make legislation, legislation can affect some countries worse than the other. Francesco is going to vote for the nature restoration law. The consequences of that in a third of Ireland is that it will put family farms out of production. And if you look at the amount of farms Europe have lost in the last, since 2010, if you look at Ireland when it joined the EEC, which was a very good project, it was a community, it, and it's now gone to union. We have gone from 300,000 farmers down to 130,000 farmers. Mm -hmm. And what you have to protect, it's not alone the farmer, it's the local community. Because in Ireland here, you have what we would call small farmers along with them that would be part-time working as well. But they build into a community that the local hardware and the local shop down the road will survive. But what we are doing is starving them putting them in a situation that if they have to re-wet their land, they don't need to live in the area. They can go from that area. What will have, what's the consequences of that? The local school will close. The local shop will close. The local community will fall apart. Is that what the European project is about? I believe at the moment there are people going around in the name of environmentalism that don't live in reality. Yes, if you can do something better, that's great. But I saw even last night in the debate that was to be had or the, the, the new targets that came out, industry have said we cannot do basically a quarter, but the EU have come out and said by 2040, we're okay. going to slash this. So All you right. have, in my opinion, civil servants dreaming up ideas that do not live in the, in the areas or work the areas or okay. live in the soil that we have to work with. There's different type of lands right around Europe. Okay. Where I am from, there is no point in trying to grow uh, soya because you, yeah. you wouldn't be fit to grow it. But there are parts of Europe that is pretty good at that. 
no more, we're able to produce quality grass-fed beef in Ireland. But we are being now told, well, you've got to cut them numbers. Every day, there is something new coming out, this drip right. feed of information that yeah. is leaving people in disarray, that is, has people okay. fed up of the whole European project the way it's yeah, going, yeah, yeah. and have people very okay, discontented. Michael. All right, Francisco, um, environmentalists don't yes. live in reality. They're going to put family farms out of business. No, again, it looks like it is, it is the green measures they are pushing farmers uh, to bankruptcy, and it's not. We are promoting a true economic uh, incentive to farmers so they can produce good quality foods and they earn money from it. And again, it was stated here that the majority of the CAP money is going to the big pharma and the big uh, industrial agriculture sector. So again, we rejected CAP. Sorry, sorry, we rejected what, the food trade agreements. Whatever, and so in the okay, end, okay, uh, again, I don't understand why you are not whatever money I get. Right. All right, Michael, Please. hang on, uh, Michael. Yeah, sorry, Francesco. Whatever money I get doesn't matter. If the, na the nature restoration law is going to flood my land, because I don't need to live in the area. Get that into your head. We farm cattle. Sure. We farm sheep. Do you know, they don't walk on water. Do you know the, and this is what the, the EU the is, is proposing on our peachy type soil. Okay. That the EU gives to Irish countries. people to show her to to, to, to keep the water out of. Gen gentlemen, we can't, hang on, we can't, we can't talk over each other big, because no one hears yeah, a but, thing. But, Fran Francisco, yes, please come back. The, the, yep. The, 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 the states, the countries have national plans that do take into account their reality. So he's just saying that we, we are going to do everything here from Brussels and we are just going to flood everything so we can rewild nature. This is just, see, this is misinformation. This is not being serious when we're having a debate. Excuse me. Right. It's national not countries can adapt their plans to Excuse the reality me. of the country. All right. Mike, Michael, just very quickly. Excuse me, it's not misinformation because the default position under the nature restoration law is that all peat soils are in bad condition. Second of all, you talk about the member state. What happens is the member state in good faith tries to do their plans. Okay. Then you will get environmentalists going to the ECJ, which has happened on the Habitats Directive. You tell me one country that isn't in a straitjacket at the moment, be it industry, roads, transport, farming or whatever. Okay. Under right. the Habitats Directive, Peter, and then I'll you be come with, along uh, and say uh, it's the Peter, member state. That's the great right. stunt by Europe all the time. Peter, I'll be back with you in just a moment, but very quickly, Francisco, I need I need a, a thirty second answer from you. Well, again, uh, this this is this is misinformation uh, in my perspective because no, again, he's not talking about saying okay. that word. Okay, all right, all right. Look, 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 okay, I'm saying misinformation. I deal with facts. All right, gentlemen, on on this, we'll agree to disagree for the moment. I want to bring Peter in because there's there's something else that I want to touch upon here, uh, Peter. To what extent is the the EU caught between a rock and a hard place here? I mean, on the one hand, it needs to implement <laughs> vital climate measures. It also needs to be mindful that as a voting bloc, farming communities are pretty powerful. Uh, how realistic is the fear that farmers and those in rural areas uh, whose incomes are dependent upon farming, uh, will vote for the far right in June's elections? Well, maybe some of them will, um, but indeed it's, it's not just the farmers that, that indeed may, uh, may move to protest parties. Many people are, are fed up with the unwillingness of the mainstream to abandon um, uh, certain um, you know, dogmas um, that indeed have been pushed by the Green Movement uh, for years. Uh, and I think that uh, our green friends, I'm sure that many of them would agree that, uh, you know, European member states are perfectly capable to decide for themselves the right balance between economy and uh, and nature. And especially if you're talking about land uh, and land use, this is typically something very local. Uh, so wh why don't we um, conclude that indeed the top-down approach has failed, uh, that indeed the straitjackets that are being imposed from the EU policy level, uh, like for example, I'm from Belgium originally, uh, and, and in the Netherlands and Belgium, you have this big nitrogen debate, which is um, about uh, severe restrictions on nitrogen emissions for farming, which has caused the Farmers' Party uh, last year to become the biggest party in the country in the Netherlands. Now, I mean, um, this is partly a national responsibility, but um, the uh, Natura directors of the EU make it very hard 
to change uh, the designation of a protected nature area once you have decided that this is protected nature. Uh, so, so I mean, what, why should the EU even have a say in this? Is Dutch democracy not capable of deciding this uh, for uh, for itself? Uh, so I think we we need to um, uh, we need to take a more okay. much more modest approach right. in Brussels. Right. Okay, Francisco. No, uh, he's clearly saying that the EU is not democratic, that the member states are not represented in the council, which they are, and that people are not elected to the parliament, that we are. So again, it, this, this idea that the far right as a solution to, to, to the problems of, of the farmers or even the, the common problems that we face in the EU, it's madness. We see the results. Even we saw the, the populist example of Brexit, that now they are facing a huge clash uh, in their economy, and they were promoted a big uh, decade of prosperity. And so these populist ideas that the far right is going to save the farmers, is going to save the economy, and that the states doesn't the, don't have the same in their own policy, is this, this populism. Sorry, but this doesn't fit to the reality. There are things that we can change, obviously, but okay. that only comes with democracy and more integration and more debates, not just going around uh, pumping our chest saying that we are going to be nationalists and we are going to solve all the problems, especially okay. when we have a climate crisis right. in our hands. Francisco, I, uh, thank you. I, Michael, I have, have a minute left on, on the programme. I want to get your reaction to that, but I also want to know whether these protests are set to continue and to get bigger. In my opinion, the protests are set to continue. Um, farmers are just, how, they are sick of what's going on right around uh, the whole of Europe. Second of all, I really hate this idea, and the Greens are, are, are saying it everywhere, far right. I am not far right. Farmers' representatives are not far right. Farmers that are farming the land are not far right. What they are is common sense. We live in a reality. We live in a world where you make your few pounds, you spend your few pounds to try and, and earn a living. And let's go back to what was said by your earlier speaker. And it just shows the way Europe has moved away from reality. We have a place here in Ireland with de that's designated, as has been spoke about in Holland. There are people in danger of losing their houses. There is an elder, elderly people in danger of getting drowned in their houses because a turlock isn't functioning. And the designated area is actually dying. Right. And the courts, because of the Habitats Directive, has blocked making okay. an, an overflow drain. Right, and it's tied up for the next four or five years. Okay. That's the Europe we live in now. Bureaucracy, right. not common right. sense. OK, there, I'm afraid, gentlemen, we're going to have to end it. Many thanks indeed to you all. Michael Fitzmaurice, Francisco Guerrero and Peter Klepper. Thank you for watching. You can see the programme again at any time by going to the website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And, of course, you can join the conversation on X. Our handle there at AJ Inside Story from me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here at Doha. We'll see you again. Bye for now.